We're going to be back in the Gospel of Mark this morning. So far, in the Gospel of Mark, over the centuries, <laughs> maybe it just seems that way for me. We've been in Gospel of Mark for a while, but uh, thus far in chapter 11 alone, uh, we have seen Jesus enter Jerusalem and do so in a triumphant manner. In fact, when he came in, there were the shouts of Hosanna from his followers anyway. And then even in the town, they were like, who's that? What is going on? And people began to crowd around him. And we talked about that triumphant uh, entry into Jerusalem that Jesus did. They were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Kind of a joyful start to uh, chapter 11 of the Gospel of Mark. Then we see Jesus curse a fig tree. Because he does not like figs, man. No, that's not true. Uh, but he did curse the fig tree. Uh, that fig tree is because it was bearing no fruit. Then he goes straight from there, and he goes into the temple in Jerusalem. After he had the night before done a little look around, saw what was going on in the temple, saw that it was kind of wanting, it was not as it should be, and he came into the temple, and he threw out all of the money changers and the people who were selling stuff to get... Uh, uh, to people who were in the Gentile court. and Anyway, he had turned the thing that should have been a house of prayer and a connection with God place into just sort of a transactional thing, and they were corrupt, and they were charging uh, a higher fee on things. The religious leaders in the temple were getting a bit of a kickback from all of that. And Jesus did, was not happy with this. This was like, this is the representation of God on the planet to everybody, and particularly to those who were the Gentiles, Wow, nope, not having that, but he went and he slept on it and came back the next day and came in and did that uh, by cleansing that temple and knocking over tables and, and showing a sure uh, a force of power and strength when he did so. Then he followed that uh, the last time we were in the Gospel of Mark talking about prayer, and interestingly enough, it dovetailed so nicely into our uh, uncertainty series that we just wrapped up last week. But he was talking about prayer, he's talking about its close relationship to faith, and uh, that's an interesting follow from uh, just saying that uh, the temple should be a house of prayer, and he talked about prayer. Now, all of this stuff that Jesus was doing, pretty much in a very short amount of time, now that he is geared up and he is headed into Jerusalem and made his presence known, uh, it made all of the religious leaders really happy. <laughs> They were so excited that he was there. No, it was the opposite of that, right? He really annoyed and angered all of the religious leaders of the day who were there in Jerusalem, particularly that part about messing around with their sweet setup, right? With the money changers in the temple. And so it really bothered him. You don't just go in and have a big splash and not have any reaction from the people that you are completely um, uh, convicting and showing uh, that they are wrong. I mean, when he comes in, he just comes in with a big splash. They were annoyed. So the religious leaders were basically at this point reaching the boiling point. All right? You ever been at that point where you're like, there are things, it's one more thing, then another thing, and then another thing, and you're, hey, you're holding it in. I'm going to love it. And then you get that crease right there. <laughs> you're going to grit your teeth. Maybe you find yourself clenching your fist until you just blow up. All right, we're getting to that point, close to that point with the religious <laughs> leaders and their relationship to Jesus. And their annoyance and their anger about him was boiling into hatred. So today we're going to look at what happens next in this story. But first, let's once again pray to the Lord. God, thank you. For your word, I thank you for the passion that you displayed uh, as you entered in this work into this world, and even particularly in this passage that we're looking at in the Gospel of Mark, where we're seeing how you went into Jerusalem. You did so with intent. You did so with uh, the people who you came to save in your heart and in your mind. You knew what was coming. You knew all that was about to happen. You knew the pain that was coming. You knew the turmoil and how the crowds were going to turn, and you knew how everything was going to happen. And yet, you still went forward. You still carried on because of us. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your strength and the power you had to accomplish this grand task. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's dive into this passage now. We're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, and we're going to begin, uh, and then we'll just begin to break apart, as uh, I often do in this passage, uh, beginning at verse 27. And this is what it says. They came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, 
And the elders came and asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? All right, let's look at these two passages, uh, these two verses here quickly, all right? It says they came into Jerusalem, all right? They came again into Jerusalem, and, uh, and then it says he was walking uh, in the temple. Now remember, this is not the time of the cleansing. That had already happened, all right? Uh, remember, we saw in uh, verse 19 of chapter 11, it said when evening came, they would go out of the city. And so that's the deal. So he'd come in, he'd do some stuff, wah, 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 and then when the night fell, he would exit the city. So nobody could just kind of, I, I think part of that was just strategic, right? So uh, people who were mad at him maybe couldn't find him. They didn't quite know where he was at night, where they might be a little bit more vulnerable with his disciples. But either way, uh, they had left. They had left Jerusalem. They got up into the hills, uh, off into the Mount of Olives, we find it, and other places. But anyway, uh, they now had returned. They came again to Jerusalem. And uh, this is pretty bold, can I just say. They, they have now come back, not just to Jerusalem, but actually back to the temple, all right? Now, this is very, very bold, I think. This is the same temple that he had gone in and caused such a ruckus, right? He had knocked over all those tables and tossed the money changers out, and kicking over the tables, all that kind of stuff. And after all of that, he still came back to the temple. That's very bold, I think. <laughs> then it says the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came. Now, these people... Uh, I'm just going to sum them up right now. Uh, we've talked about various parts of the religious system of the day, but basically we're just going to call these guys the religious leaders, the ones who were most annoyed about what was happening with Jesus in the temple. All right, So we got the chief priests, uh, we got the scribes, and the elders, and they came in and they asked him. Now, as I said, these are the Jewish religious leaders that were in Jerusalem itself. And even though Jesus was back, he came back to Jerusalem, and even though he came back to the temple, and even though he was walking around in the temple yet again, uh, he was not seeking these guys out. Jesus didn't go like, cleanse the temple, now I'm going to get the leaders, right? And coming in, where are they? Where, who's in charge? And Jesus didn't come in looking for them. That's not the idea. He was just back at the temple. They came looking for him. They came to him. Now, can you... Can you imagine these guys? Imagine these leaders with me for just a moment, right? Uh, I, I can just hear them saying, you know, would you, would you just look at this place, right? <laughs> Say they came in, they didn't see it happen, they came in, everything's gone. What, what has happened here? Just Jesus came in here, he messed everything up. What, wait a second, there he is now, <laughs> right? That's him. And they come up to him and they come in hot, right? So they're seeing him now, so they approach him. I mean, if you've ever had anybody come at you quickly, uh, and you know how startling that can be, but Jesus was not thrown off by this, all right? He was not uh, taken aback like, oh no, boys, get around me, right? He, he pulled the disciples and put them in front, and he's there. None of that, right? He's just ready to meet them. He was ready for them. It's not like he didn't know that they might come around, but my point is, he didn't go in there to just give them a hard time. They came to him to give him a hard time. And so, uh, they asked him, it says, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Now, this is very interesting in the Gospel of Mark because this isn't the first time that the authority of Jesus was talked about. In fact, uh, in the very first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and I believe I even did a message way back in the day in chapter 1. You guys remember chapter 1 of the Gospel of Mark? <laughs> uh, and it was about Jesus' authority, right? Well, anyhow, <clears throat> we saw in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it said, They went into Capernaum, and right away he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach. And they were astonished at his teaching, because he was teaching them as one who had authority not like the scribes he was teaching and again this was Capernaum it wasn't Jerusalem totally different place different people there and everything but they were responding to the authority of Jesus that he taught with authority and they were amazed by it they were marveled by it and um, they, he, they, there's a distinction here that he was not like the scribes 
He didn't teach like the scribes. And the scribes and the, the teachers, the religious leaders of the day, they would often begin their teaching by, by starting with somebody else, somebody else's authority that they would then bring to you. Now, I'm saying this on the authority of, or from the, uh, the passage of whatever, right? <laughs> and it was not just them. So anyway, <clears throat> in, uh, they were astonished. Not so much in how Jesus, or rather, it, what he was saying was truly remarkable, but it wasn't just what he was saying. It was even how he said it. He said what he said. He taught like he did with authority, unlike the scribes. Now, those scribes often would refer to those uh, people who were keeping track of the writings of the law, and the authorities and the traditions of the elders, right? So it all kind of comes together here. Uh, but they, they didn't teach with authority. They taught from an authority. And it reminds me of the guy I saw on a religious TV program. I'm not gonna call anybody out, right? Um, I mean, I might, but, <laughs> but this is not necessary. Uh, but it was a religious TV channel, but it was one of the more formal um, ecclesiastical <laughs> type, uh, you know, there was a little bit more lit liturgy involved in the deal. But this is what I remembered about the guy, okay? Uh, he had on a very uh, religious robe on. Uh, he had a very finely trimmed beard. I do remember that. Uh, and he had glasses on like I'm wearing today. Probably not like I'm wearing, but he had some on. Uh, and what would happen was he would uh, lean into the, to the pulpit he had. And he would read something from the Bible or from somewhere. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. And then he would like, he would look across the crowd. I'm looking at you, Kevin. <laughs> Thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> and he was just like, it was like, really, dude? <laughs> Who's listening to you? Who cares about you're just judging? You're just reading this. I mean, I'm looking at you. How about you? Maybe you're stealing. That's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm thinking my first thought because the way you're glaring at everybody and all that judgment and everything. And uh, anyway, that's what I think of when I think of the scribes. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> I guess when I think of the scribes, the Pharisees, and those uh, religious leaders of the law, that they they kind of were like that, right? Uh, but Jesus, he spoke as somebody who was himself, he himself was the authority. He didn't say, you, uh, so-and-so says, and this person says, or this prophet says, or you'll find in the teachings of Moses this, 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 this. That's not how he would start. He would simply uh, say that, uh, I say unto you, <laughs> right? I say unto you. Now, he might say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. He doesn't say, I heard authority from this person, but this person has a greater authority over here, and so that's the one I'm going with. No, he doesn't. He'll call those things out, and then he says, I say to you. And he spoke like someone who knew what he was talking about. His authority was based on who he was and is. Right? He knew what he was saying. He knew what we would call the Old Testament, what they would just call the Holy Scriptures at the time. He knew them completely. Because he was God with us uh, in, uh, in all of his majesty. And yet, 100% uh, man, 100% God, the mystery of the incarnation. But either way, he spoke with authority. Not just talking about something he had seen or heard and he's telling you about it. He's telling you straight from the source. Now, these religious leaders from the Jerusalem temple, they were not coming at Jesus because they were in awe of his authority, much like the ones in Capernaum. They were amazed by his teaching with authority. These guys were coming at Jesus not because they were in awe of his authority. They were coming at Jesus because they were mad, <laughs> right? And they wanted to know, who do you think you are, right? Who gives you the right to come in here, right, and do all of these things? This is our temple, man. Who are you? What are you doing kind of here messing everything up? Who gave you the right? Who gave you the authority? So, Jesus answers their harsh question with a question, right? And in Mark chapter 11, verses 29 through 30, it says, Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> then answer me, and I, then I will, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. All right, so get that. Okay, that's the question he's asking in verse 29. Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, then answer me. If you, the idea is like, if you can answer this, then I'll tell you, right? 
Uh, and this was the question. Uh, verse 30, was John's baptism from heaven or of human, answer, uh, human origin? Answer me. So this is a little pointed from Jesus, okay? So he already knows as these people come to him what their heart is all about. He already knows why they're coming up to him. They are not seeking advice from the rabbi, the teacher. They're not here to learn. They're not here to find out. They are mad and they are accusatory. They're trying to trap him and they want to mess everything up in front of everybody else. So Jesus turns that around. He's not dodging things. He just says, I will ask you this question. You answer me and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. And then there's the zinger. Was John's baptism from heaven or was it of human origin? Now, if you don't know anything about the Bible, you don't know anything about this story, you don't know who, well, who's John, what's going on here, what is happening here. Well, in uh, another part of the scripture, we see that John the Baptist was the herald. He was the one who prepared the way for Jesus, right? And he came in, and uh, he was baptizing people, and the religious leaders of the day didn't really like John, although some of them came to be baptized. But even then, John the Baptist was like, what are you snakes doing here, right? He's like, all right, you know, you've got, you've got, the, you've got the, uh, the word already, you should know this. But uh, anyway, they treated him harshly in many ways and did not recognize him as a prophet, but all the people did. All of the people who saw John the Baptist thought, man, this is a prophet. This is unlike anything we've heard. Hasn't happened in Israel in decades, in fact, hundreds of years. Have we seen anybody like a prophet like John the Baptist? And John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus walking up as he was baptizing people, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who saves the world. He's come to say, take the sin of the world upon himself. Can you imagine? So here they are, right? Here are these religious leaders having now to answer this question that Jesus is posing to them so wisely, I'll tell you where my authority comes from. I'll tell you. But first you tell me, was John, what was he? Was his baptism he was doing? Is that just something of human origin? Or did that come from God? Was he a prophet from God? You tell me. <laughs> right? Wow. Just, I mean, I'm sure there was like a, a, a silence for a minute. These guys didn't know what they had just walked into. <laughs> uh, Pastor David Gerzik says it this way. He said, when Jesus asked them to answer the question regarding John the Baptist, he was not evading their question. If John really was from God, then he was right about Jesus. And Jesus was indeed the Messiah. If what John said was true, then Jesus had all authority. And the famous uh, commentator of Scripture, A.T. Robertson, said, It was not a dodge, but a home <laughs> thrust <laughs> that cleared the air and defined their attitude both to John and Jesus. They rejected John as they now reject Jesus. And so we see this in the next <coughs> couple of verses, verse 31 and 32. They discussed it among themselves. <laughs> so here's Jesus' pointed question, and I can just think like, yeah, a little backup, maybe? <coughs> a little huddle? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What are we going to do? What, are we gonna do? What, are we gonna, what do you think? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know what do you think. All right? But we, kinda, we get a little bit of what their conversation was here. They discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say... I mean, look at this, this posturing they're doing. It's for the crowd. It's for what they want to do. They're not seeking anything but trying to get Jesus into trouble here somehow. If we say... From heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, there's this little dash, little pause, they were afraid, not of Jesus, they were afraid of the crowd. Because everyone thought, I mean, regardless of what they may have thought about Jesus at this time, regardless of how the seeds of uh, dissent had begun to happen in the crowds in Jerusalem, what they thought about John that was something that was fairly established among the crowd. If we say human origin, they're going to afraid of the crowd because everyone thought that John was truly a prophet. They thought they were so clever. <laughs> they thought they were smarter. They thought they had more authority. They thought they were about to metaphorically body slam Jesus, right? <laughs> they come out here in front of everybody. But Jesus just yanks the rug out from underneath them and he completely turns that situation around and, uh, and just kind of owned that situation with just the sting of the truth, man. You know? And it just becomes really clear, really obvious. 
they were stuck. Their plan to discredit Jesus had backfired in their faces. Um, and so <laughs> they are discussing it among themselves because they knew there was no out. There was no way to trick. There was no way to trap. There was no way to twist the words around because he had them, right? It's like checkmate question to them. They, so they discussed it among themselves. But they were embarrassed, <laughs> not repentant. They were embarrassed in front of people. They weren't repentant because they'd encountered truth. They were angry, not humble. So then we see verse 33. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. <laughs> they probably didn't say it like that. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Because they were not interested in the truth. They were not seeking the truth. They wanted to save face. We don't know. They were lying. They did know. That's the thing. Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So when they said, we don't know, Jesus' response communicated, yes, you do. <laughs> You most certainly do. And you could change it. Here's the deal. This is an open-ended thing, right? I'm not going to tell you. Did you know any one of them, any of those hard-hearted religious leader people, could have gone, he's right. We're wrong. Maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. John the Baptist, he was a prophet. What have I been thinking? The scriptures are alive, and they could have turned, and they, they, they could have begun to follow, but they didn't. Why? They were embarrassed. They, were, they, they had to save face. Uh, their pride. All kinds of things going on. Can I just say to you, Proverbs 12, 15 said, a fool's way, a fool's way is right in his own eyes. But whoever listens to counsel is wise. <coughs> right in his own eyes. How many people, maybe that's you today, maybe you not, you're not fully trusting in Jesus because you indeed, even as I mentioned, uh, talking about an atheist uh, last week, you're, you're mad at him and you're embarrassed and you're trying to prove something and you're trying to uh, disprove something and you're not seeking him or seeking truth. Jesus knew that these religious leaders were not seeking truth and he responded with the application of true wisdom. True wisdom. <clears throat> And here it is, Proverbs 23, 9. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my place on the page there. Don't speak to a fool. <laughs> Let's think about this Jesus, I'm not going to answer you. Because you were being very foolish. Don't speak to a fool, for he will despise the insight of your words. Someone who is foolishly attacking, someone who is just a skeptic at heart, someone who has a whole other agenda and is not seeking truth, you don't have to have every answer for them if you're a follower of Jesus, by the way. You can be the answer to them by what God is doing in your life. You can, you can have answers and you can respond, but don't waste time. And Jesus didn't waste time at this point. You've given him many opportunities. When we are seeking the truth, everything is different. When we're actually seeking truth, it's completely different. In fact, Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will see me, and he was talking to the nation of Israel. And I believe that this very verse is true to you and me even today because of the principle throughout all of Scripture Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You will seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And Hebrews eleven six 6 says, now without faith, it is impossible to please God. It says the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Seek him. Not to seek and destroy. <laughs> Not to knock it out of the park and just make a point or a name for yourself. Not to hang on to your own pride and arrogance. But to genuinely seek the truth. What do you do when you encounter the harsh reality of the truth? And it is the opposite of the way you live and who you are. And you see the sin in your own life as you confront Jesus. How do you respond? How you respond is extraordinarily important because Jesus is the only real authority for all of our lives. 
Uh, Matthew chapter 28, as Jesus was getting ready to ascend back into heaven, he had all those who were gathered around him who had seen him as the risen Jesus. And he was about to ascend, as I said, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he commissions them, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So how are you approaching Jesus today? With arrogance? With anger? Or are you seeking the truth? I'm going to give us a chance to respond to this passage uh, that we just read, how Jesus dealt with some religious people. Maybe you're a religious person. And it's all about the external. It's all about the, uh, the ritual, maybe. It's all about the, what you do. And that does involve what you do, but that comes later. How are you dealing with Jesus? How do you approach Him today? How do you approach the tr truth of who He is? Romans 3.23 tells us all of us have sinned <coughs> short of God's glory. Every person on planet Earth. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages, or what we earn from that sin, is death. So we're all in trouble. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's our, there's our answer. There's our salvation. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And by the way, let me just remind you, that's the Jesus we've been looking at here today. His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Romans 10.13 says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, is that you today? Have you ever placed your faith in Jesus? Have you been holding out? Have you been angry with Him? You can fall down before Him today. Let Him soften your heart. Break that out of shell and connect with Him today. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, but you know today is your day, you sense Him, you sense the reality of Him, something about the words from Scripture being spoken have just touched your heart in such a way that you know it to be true, you can uh, pray with me right now. Jesus, Lord, today I realize, I confess, I am a sinner. I'm someone who needs you. I'm believing on you right now, God, to save me. Please change me. I, don't, I know there's a lot for me to learn and understand about all this. I, there are a lot of details that I don't understand, but God, I am believing right now that you, Jesus, are the Son of God. I believe you died on a cross for me, in my place. You took my sin upon you. You rose from the dead. You made it possible for me to have forgiveness, to have a new life. So Jesus, I pray right now, please forgive me for anything I've ever done that was wrong, anything that was off track. Forgive me of my sin. I pray that you change me. Make me a new person. Help me to follow you from this day forward with everything that I have. I'm trusting you to save me today. If you're a follower of Jesus, you might want to pray this with me. Lord, thank you so much for the truth that you bring. It's harsh, it's hard sometimes to realize my sinfulness before you. But God, I pray that you would help me to bend my life to your will and your purposes rather than always trying to get you to bend to my will. God, help me to recognize you as the authority. Lord, I understand that sometimes uh, I just go into my own uh, way of thinking and I fall back on uh, a sinful self that says I'm the authority <coughs> and I don't want to yield to you. And Lord, I pray you'd soften me and draw me to you and yield to your authority <coughs> this week. I trust you and I love you and I thank you, God, for dying for me and for the life you've made possible uh, for me to have today. We pray these things together now in the name of Jesus. Amen.